to be continued. <laughs> what the frick? Gosh dang, what'd you do that for? Game? Oh frick! Oh frick! Ew! I do not want it. <laughs> Get him, girl. How's it going, everybody? Hoodlamunt here, back with some more Chaos Head Noah. And I'm um, feeling a little more confident now after taking that break there for a little bit. Um, playing some Shantae on stream. Go over and follow me over there on uh, Twitch at nice. Hoodlamunt as well, uh, where I've been doing that. But I do voices for the Shantae game that I've been playing. And uh, I think I can do the voices good enough that we're going to try and do this again. So uh, here we are. Uh, but last time, oh boy, we still don't trust uh, Demi, and certainly, well, certainly not Demi, but but also not uh, Miss Mikun as well. Um, we got to see the big bad talk to a ghetto froggy for some reason, so I, I don't know if ghetto froggies have some sort of importance or something, like if they're, you know, like... Like, I don't know if they're, like, maybe being used as tools to control people or if he was just doing that for funsies. I don't know. But he was talking to a ghetto froggy about his evil master plan, you know, and all that crap. So, uh, Orihara got her hand sewn back on, I guess. Uh, but I'm skeptical of if if it actually was cut off and put back on and working properly in the amount of time that we've had for that to happen because uh, she seems like she was using it fine other than the bandage being on it so um i don't know and then lastly we found out which i think was the biggest uh piece of information of last episode that really was kind of pushing things further along is we found out that yua had a sister named mia who died because of the group dive incident, and ever since then has been investigating the uh, new gen cases, trying to figure out who's behind them and what's going on with all that. And uh, I think uh, I think uh, I deserve some uh, props for that. You know, I think I deserve a like, a subscribe, a comment down below of how intelligent I am, just you know, stroking my ginormous ego. Because I'm just right, man. I'm always right about these things. I told you Yua had, she, she had a relative of some kind that, that was a part of this and died. And that's why she was like grilling us, you know? I just, I freaking knew it. So anyway, now we're here. And uh, I believe we're in the mind of Takami again. Um, so without further ado, let's just get back into this, shall we? Now that it was November... I had a feeling that the sun was already setting much earlier than before. By the time Demi and I started heading home together after school, a faint orange was already staining the sky. I'm sorry. Despite being silent up until now, Demi abruptly apologized. It must have been really, really hard, Taku. It was the first time I'd gone home with Demi in a while. I was genuinely really happy that she'd come back. She'd even been the one to initiate it, saying, Let's walk home together. Since we'd only gone home together no more than twice, I'd secretly been worried that it would never happen again. However, that turned out not to be the case. I'm sorry I wasn't by your side. In that earthquake, someone I know got hurt. And I've been taking care of them ever since. Wait, we know she showed up to see, uh, to see what the frick is her name. Why can I not remember her name? Fess. Oh, gosh dang, I couldn't, I can't remember what her actual name is, but Fess. She showed up to the hospital where Fess was, remember? And she was, like, kind of stalking her while they took her in on the on the stretcher or whatever the crap they were taking her into the hospital with. Is that the person she's talking about? Huh. Even though I hadn't asked, Demi was kind enough to explain herself to me. Okay. 
though to be frank, almost all of Beamy's words were going in one ear and out the other. Oh yeah, he's still, still locked on that still. <laughs> the bandage. The bandage I'd seen on Nanami's wrist at lunch break. It had been burned into my eyes and refused to go away. Are you... mad? In the end, I had failed to say anything to Nanami. I'd been too scared. Even though Nanami was my little sister, even though I was Nanami's older brother, something had just felt unbelievably strange, and I had no idea what it was. The nurse had said that Nanami had no injuries. That hand that Shogun had delivered to my base had disappeared from the fridge without a trace. It all had to have been a delusion. But if that was true, why had Nanami's right wrist been wrapped in a bandage? Though it was possible that I was just overthinking it, and that she'd just gotten burned, or stung by something, or got some other stupid minor injury that didn't matter at all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that was probably it. That was the most logical answer. But, even now, I was still too scared to check. Even after failing to save her, I was... Still, just pacing around doing nothing. Not even trying to talk to her. My very own sister. I really was the worst brother ever. Um, Taku? Hello? Are you listening? If you're mad, then just say so. But being ignored like this... Hurts pretty bad. Uh huh? I looked over at Themi, who seemed weirdly disheartened. Oh, uh, uh, uh huh? Have you not been listening this whole time? After hesitating for a second, I nodded. And the moment I did, Themi jabbed my cheek with her forefinger. She, and here I thought you were giving me the silent treatment. Don't be so confusing. Communication is key. Ow. <laughs> you just jabbed your nail into my cheek. <laughs> Are you okay? Demi finally stopped poking me, and out came those words I heard so often from her. Words of worry and concern. Words that I'd heard from Themi again and again. Ever since lunchtime, you haven't been looking so good. And you seem pretty drained, too. Oh no. Was someone mean to you? If so, then you better tell me. I'm ready to get mad right along with you. She was acting like an older sister, or a guardian, even. Demi was just a hopeless meddler. <laughs> well, that'd been obvious from the moment she'd given an otaku freak like me the time of day. I was grateful to her for being worried about me. Before now, I'd either bottled up my worries deep inside, or posted them anonymously on At Channel. Should I tell her about what happened with Nanami? But when I'd told her about the D-Sword that one time, she hadn't believed me at all. Then again, that would be the natural response from anyone sane. So, if I were to tell her about Nanami, she'd probably either A, be speechless, or B, just laugh in my face. And if that was true, there really was no point in telling her. All I needed was for her to stay by my side. 
it would be better to bring up the topic with Kozapi or Senna instead. Interesting. Just as messy as ever. <laughs> Mere moments after stepping foot into my base, Dimi muttered that in exasperation. And yet, paradoxically, she seemed to be smiling happily as well. Weird. Guess some things never change. It wouldn't really feel like your room if it wasn't messy. <laughs> if you're gonna be like that, then just clean it. Be my guest. With a sigh, I turned on my PC. Hang on a second. What? Are you seriously getting on the computer the second after we got back? You've got a friend over, so can't you at least show the tiniest bit of hospitality? <laughs> Come on, why don't we just talk for a little bit? <laughs> oh man, come on, why are you giving me a freaking... Uh, already? I'm getting another decision. Over this? Okay, um... Shoot, man. Uh... Gosh, I, uh, see, I can't do green. I just refuse still. So I it's not a red moment, even though I know she's like not out for my best interest. I'm going to keep neutral for now and see what happens, I guess. But let's see what he says here real quick. After hitting me with such an unreasonable demand, Dimi sat down on the sofa. If I tried to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a 3D girl, it would be over in seconds. As much as I'd gotten used to talking with Dimi, since I'd had a lot more chance to do so recently, I still doubted I'd even last five minutes. Moreover, my head was already fully occupied with the stuff about Nanami, so I very much didn't feel up for a casual conversation. And so, I resorted to just ignoring her. I sat down in my chair, all while remaining painfully aware of my own worthlessness. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I can't. I just. I still can't do green, man. But red didn't seem right. Red seemed like that would turn bad. So I don't know. Well then, even after everything, you're still ignoring me. I see how it is. I sensed Demi shoot off the couch and onto her feet. She then came up next to me and slowly picked up the toy D-sword leaning against the table. Ignoring my confusion, she held up the upper part of the sword and assumed a stance. If you're gonna be that way, then I'm gonna do this! <laughs> she swung the sword down. Wait! <laughs> she was obviously just messing around and wasn't actually trying to hurt me. But regardless, she jabbed me in the back with the tip of the sword. <laughs> Hiya! Boop! <laughs> Next, she bonked me on the head, and when I tried to wave her off in annoyance, she deftly dodged my counter. Come on, come on! Let's do something! Don't make me use this thing for real! Um. Mm do something? L like what? Mid-diagonal slash aimed straight at my neck. Dimi stopped to ponder a little. Hmm. I don't know. Like some computer game or something? You're good at those, right? How about something where we can go head-to-head? -head? I've never played anything like that before. So you could show me the ropes. Unfortunately, the only games I had were ESO and a catalog of Edoge, neither of which had versus modes. <laughs> you don't even have to consider the versus modes when you said that part of your cache of games is Edoge. If that's all you have and then ESO, you don't need to mention the... It doesn't matter if there was a versus mode. <laughs> Come on, man. Please. I can't. I don't have any... games like that. 
I grabbed the tip of the sword and pushed it aside. Dissatisfied, Demi pursed her lips into a pout, then put the sword back where she'd found it. Come on. It's been forever since we last saw each other. Okay. And I'm happy to hear that you want to spend time with me, but... I'm just not in the mood to do something fun right now. Not with everything going on. Oh, that was weird. You've got mail, you big dum-dum. <laughs> ah, what was that? Oh, it's nothing. <laughs> He's getting outed. Oh no, no. Wait a second. Dimi had just heard my Sataton notification tone. Oh, frick. How embarrassing. <laughs> when I opened my email software, I saw about three messages from Grimm telling me to join the chat room. Now that I thought about it, I hadn't really chatted much with Grimm recently. We'd used to talk online pretty much every day. But since I'd been refraining from playing ESO, it'd been around ten days since we'd last talked. Oh boy, here we go. Uh. Yo. Hey, Nidhar kun I've been waiting for you. Because there's been another nude gen. Nude gen? <laughs> What are you even talking about? Insert ASC2 art here. What? <laughs> okay. New gen, dude! What the frick do you think I'm on about? How exactly did we go from new gen to nude gen? New generation, new gen, nude gen, nude gen. Come on, that crap's obvious. Use common sense for crap's sake. More importantly, there's a seventh case. <laughs> what is it? Likely having noticed my gasp, Demi stood up and walked over to me. She peeked over my shoulder at the monitor. The seventh case? It happened again. Another new gen. How long was this darn thing gonna go on for? Was I next? Would I be the victim of the eighth case? The ninth? Taku, you've got nothing to worry about. Oh, see, I'm telling you, dude, she's hearing our thoughts, man. I know we're not talking out loud. It's not possible, dude. We're, she's in our freaking mind. Ah, oh, frick. There's nothing to be afraid of. No one's coming after you. You're perfectly safe. You're just being a little paranoid, okay? <laughs> that was completely baseless encouragement. You can't calm me down with such weak sauce crap, Dimi. Anxiety aside, Grimm was pretty much the new gen news guy at this point. He'd been keeping me in the loop about basically everything. Even now, he was going out of his way to link a bunch of blog posts and news articles about it. Seemed like he really wanted me to take a look. Biting my lip, I reluctantly clicked the first link. Oh boy, here we go. Uh, okay, um, 7th new gen case dubbed the DQN puzzle. Uh, the November, on November 4th, at approximately 4.50 a.m., the dead bodies of three men were discovered hanging from an iron pole near a railroad in Shibuya, Tokyo. The deceased have been identified as 19-year-old Fujita Kohei, uh, unemployed, 20-year-old Anzawa Saburo, a college student, and 19-year-old Takagi Dio a construction worker. According to the police, the bodies were severed in half at the waist, but the wounds do not indicate the use of any sharp weaponry. Furthermore, the bottom halves of each of the bodies were interchanged with one another, uh, becoming new combinations 
which were tightly sewn back together with threads. Oh, with thread. Uh, carved into uh, each body were the letters D, Q, and N, respectively. The police are investigating the uh, visibility? No, responsibility? I can't read what that is. Uh, that this may... Oh, the possibility that this may be a message left behind by the culprit. So, interesting information, though, because if this is the same... The same... Um, the, the same gang that was beating up on Takami before Orihara came and found us, the Iron Pole thing wasn't there. We never took them to a railroad. Right? I don't believe so. Nothing of that nature ever happened. They were just dead on the ground or something. We, I guess we didn't check to see if they were actually dead. We just knew they were a bloody mess. So, someone else did something with them. Right? Or delusioned them over there or something. Okay. Alright, I just... I was trying to make sure because I'm like, that's, that's new information. We didn't have that before. Uh... Oh, okay. Um... So, on the popular anonymous online message board, at channel images of the... Oh, at channel. Images of the incident were leaked prior to official coverage of the events. It has already been accepted as the seventh case of the New Gen Madness, a.k.a. New Gen, and it was uh, christened the DQN puzzle due to the manner in which the top and bottom halves of the corpses were recombined. Notably on at channel... Uh, the term DQN means an individual lacking basic common sense. Uh, regarding the serial new gen cases, the mourning families of the victims have been taken uh, have been taking legal action against some particularly offensive posts on at channel, a move which has sparked fierce debate online. Posted at three almost thirty p.m. Okay. Okay. A uh, thousand calls about the Esper boy. His body was glowing. Our body? Is that the? Is that related? Mysterious eyewitness testimony you won't see on TV. Uh, Je okay. All right. Oh, okay. This again. All right. Um. Oh boy. Okay. Uh, let's see. It is I anonymous says. New nude gen for the win. Wheat. <laughs> uh, it is I anonymous also said uh, wait it says DQN Lomao literally zero connection to the other cases police are dumb as crap Raffle uh, it is I anonymous uh, posted 920 uh, or I guess tagged 920 uh, you trying to say it's one of us anti DQNs huh with their lower bodies swapped around and crap it's like a puzzle but with corpses. If only I could trade in my upper body for some alphas, Lamau. <laughs> it is I, Anonymous, also said. Our Esper boy Nishijo will sniff out the perp for us any time now. Lol. Oh boy. Alright. It is I, Anonymous, also said. Nude Gen News Bearer. Nude Gen number one equals group dive. Nude Gen number two equals man child. Nude Gen number three equals crucifixion. Nude Gen number four equals vamp buyer. Nude Gen number five equals numbskull. Nude Gen number six equals finger food. Nude Gen number seven equals DQN puzzle. Nude Gen number. Hmm? To be continued! <laughs> What the frick? Gosh, dang, what'd you do that for? Game? Unnecessary jump scare? <laughs> In my freaking Chaos Head game, hello? I played these games not- I, I'd be playing a horror game if I wanted to jump scare. Goodness gracious. Anyway. At approximately 4.50 this morning near a railroad in Shibuya, a passing newspaper salesman discovered the bodies of three male homicide victims suspended from an iron pole. Yeah, we didn't do that crap up there. The police investigation discovered that the victims were all residents of Shibuya. Fujita Kohei, unemployed. Anzawa Sabaro, a college student. And Tagaki Tio, a construction worker. Each victim had been severed in half at the waist. Their upper and lower bodies were then interchanged with one another. 
and stitched back together with thread. There were also mysterious wounds carved into their foreheads, and the police are investigating the possibility that they may be a message left by the culprit. The authorities believe the case is part of a series of grotesque murders that have been occurring in Shibuya over the past two months. The investigation is ongoing. Okay. At the end of the news clip, photographs of the three victims were shown. I... had seen... those faces before. It's them. You know them? The guys who, who beat me up y yesterday. I'd given them my wallet, but they kicked my butt anyway. I'd then fallen unconscious, and when I woke up, Kozapi was beside me. The three of them had been collapsed on the ground, covered in blood. I dug my wallet out of my pocket and stared at it intently. When I came to, Kozapi had been carrying it, and she'd given it back to me soon after. Could the person who'd killed those three be... They want us to think that, but I bet it was us, right? I bet it was actually us, not, not Orihara. Oh man, okay. I'm still so confused. I still just, I have no idea. I'm just along for the ride, man. I, I keep saying that over and over, but it's because I literally, this game is too hard to figure anything out. I can only piece together the amount of information they give me, but everything is so nonsensical half the time. You know, it's like, and when you're playing with delusions, I can never know if it's real. It's just, this is so difficult. I'm just kind of going with it for now, you know? No, definitely not. The last time I'd seen them, they had been beaten to a pulp and covered in blood. But they hadn't been cut in half or anything. Okay, interesting. Which would mean... They'd been killed after Kozapi and I had left. It had to have been Shogun. That wrinkly jerk was just trying to provoke me. Darn it! He really was committed to driving me insane. Just how far was he willing to go? I wanted to vomit. I clutched my stomach as it churned in pain. Was I next? Would I be next to die? Oh gosh darn it. And that's enough. A hand reached out from behind me and pushed the power button on the monitor. The screen went pitch black. Take a deep breath. There's nothing to worry about. It's just a coincidence. It has to be. Why was Demi acting so ridiculously optimistic? This couldn't possibly be just a series of coincidences. More importantly, I'm starving. Hey, there's this one place I go to all the time. You want to grab something to eat there? It's both tasty and cheap. You've got my Demi guarantee. Well... A lot of customers there are on the older side, so it's a little embarrassing for me to go on my own. Oh, and you have to go inside a train station to get to it. Shibuya Station, to be specific. If you take the inside route, you can get to the platform where it's at via the Yamanote line, or you can go in straight from outside. Me, though? I definitely prefer the inside route. Food, huh? I really, really didn't have much of an appetite right now. It felt like Shogun was holding a knife straight to my throat. Like he was saying, I can kill you whenever I please. Please, just let me go. What had I done to deserve this? I couldn't take it anymore. Oh boy, okay.
Oh, we're back with we're back with the uh, freaking Fess. Okay, Ayase, that was her name. Gosh, I kept wanting to say like Akito or something, and I'm like, I know that's not it. Yeah, Ayase. Kishimoto Ayase was lying in a hospital bed, idly gazing out the window. No bars lined the outside of it, a fact which set it apart from those at Ark Heart Medical, where Ayase had stayed in the past. All that stood past the window's frame was the landscape of Shinjuku, decorated by skyscrapers and illuminated by the sunset. Flocks of pigeons soared freely through the sky, flapping their wings to their heart's content. Every now and then, she would gaze upon this sight with a pained expression. Her slightly tired eyes were empty and bleak. Her irises reflected nothing. Her lips, which could let flow a voice so beautiful it shook the youth of Shibuya, were now sealed tight. Not even so much as a hum escaped from them. Following her suicide attempt, an event which caused quite the turmoil, she had been admitted to the psychiatric ward of a large hospital in Yayogi. Her injuries were already very nearly healed. According to the doctors, it had been nothing short of a miracle that she had been able to survive a fall from that height, let alone with barely even a scratch. However, she had indeed hit her head fairly hard, and as such, she had been rushed to the hospital, primarily so they could see how the situation would develop. It had already been over a week since then. However, despite her having been admitted for such a reason, all it seemed to entail was a few rudimentary tests taken every couple of days or so. Beyond that, she had been rather neglected. Her hospital room was private, but no other beds inside it. Also, I didn't point it out until just now, but her sword is just kind of sitting there against the wall? Like, what? Ever since her stay had begun, her D-sword had been leaning against the window. It constantly emitted a blue light, yet nobody who visited her ever seemed to notice. But it sat there. Doesn't she have to summon it? Why did it? How did it come on? Her, is it? She's acting as though it came on its own, or the narrator's. Not that there had been many visitors to begin with. Phantasm fans would attempt to force their way into her room daily but as they always caused a disturbance in the process, the hospital had an excuse to forbid them from visiting her. And since Ayase was somewhat detached from her family, there were almost no others who came to visit her. Her fellow band members had made an appearance once, but Ayase used that opportunity to announce her decision for the band to break up. Oh, frick! They had not contacted her again since. Oh, frick, okay. Dang! I wonder if uh, Nishijo will find out about that. Probably Demi, too. You know, she'll probably be like, No, my favorite band broke up. I'm so sad. Is it going to be that nurse? I freaking knew it was going to be freaking... Oh my gosh, yeah, I forget her name. What's her name? I knew it was going to be that nurse. You just heard me saying it. Gosh, dang it. She's part of this, dude. I knew it. I knew it from the beginning. She's part of this somehow. She's like working with Nozomi, bro. Gosh, dang it. What's her name? Hayase? Not Hayase. That, I'm mixing two names. It's, uh, 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 well, they'll say it in a minute. Kishimoto-san. Did your thermometer beep? A nurse wearing white scrubs opened the door to the room, then swiftly entered. Ayase slowly turned to look at the nurse's face then took out the thermometer that had been resting under her arm. It was as if she had only just remembered its presence. Wait, I just remembered! She's at this hospital, but this is not the hospital that freaking uh, 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 Nishijo was at. Takumi was at the other hospital, right? Because he, he didn't recognize the hospital or something like that, I believe, right? Isn't this a different hospital? How is she working at this one and the other one where Nishijo's at? I'm telling you, dude, she's freaking, she's an agent. She's a freaking agent, man. The nurse took a look at the recorded temperature shown on its digital screen, then took note of it on the clipboard she had brought with her. 
37.1 degrees Celsius. I don't know how bad that is, I'm used to Fahrenheit. <laughs> you have a very slight fever. My head hurts. Ayase grimaced in pain once again. Oh dear, is your headache back? I'm afraid that's just a side effect of the medicine we gave you. It'll be gone before long, so try your best to ignore it. Having recorded her temperature, the nurse consoled Ayase with a kind smile. Her expression was so gentle, it was clear to all how she was able to put her patients at ease. And yet, despite the nurse's attempts, Ayase simply pushed her hand against her forehead as she shook it back and forth. Ayase had been plagued by mild headaches ever since she had first been hospitalized. They were not especially painful, but they still left her with an uncomfortable feeling that refused to go away. One that felt as if her brain itself was convulsing. It even reached the point where her ability to think was impaired. As well as this, her body would feel as heavy as lead. Ayase had experienced such symptoms in the past, namely, when she had been institutionalized at Ark Heart Medical. Back then, her head had constantly been split apart by painful headaches, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. It deprived her of all sleep and emotional stability. Those were the memories she did not want to resurface. The past she had sealed away. The events of around two years ago. And yet, her headache was causing them to flash back into her mind once more. Oh, frick! Oh, frick! Ew! Oh, no, no, dude! Oh, no! Oh, no! They experimented on her, dude! Oh, frick! So it's not just our hospital that did this, the other ones too. Oh no. No, 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 no. Okay. Alright. In them, a dark room. Its single window locked behind bars. Apart from the wall in which that window stood, the rest of the walls were covered with mirrors. Ayase had been placed in the center of the room, sat in a crude steel chair. She was wearing headgear with countless cables protruding from it. Her hands were tied to the back of the chair. Her head was locked in place, with her chin tilted slightly upward. Not another soul was present in the room. Thus, all that could be heard were the sounds of Ayase's labored breathing and the metal groans of the chair she sat on. Gosh dang it. <laughs> Saliva trickled down from the corners of her mouth, accompanied by moans akin to those of a beast's. If anyone were to hear them, they would never be able to guess that they would have been coming from a girl as young as her. She was being tortured. Slow, methodical torture. One that made very, very little sound. The method only involved one single thing. Not even an action. A drop of water, falling from above, onto her forehead, every five seconds, on the same exact spot. Chinese torture, really? Wow. That was all it took. And it would continue unrelentingly for two full days. The result? Ayase could think only of the drop that would fall next. Her senses were sharpened to their limits. And each time a drop fell onto her forehead, another hallucination would be born. 
one in which each and every nerve across her body was plucked out one by one. One in which the bones of her entire skeleton crumbled to dust. One in which her head was pierced by a long, sharp owl. One in which all liquids within her body, including her blood, froze to ice. One in which the skin lining her entire body slowly rotted away, before eventually peeling off. Assailed without end by these sensations, Ayase could no longer maintain her sanity. Yo, man, what the frick, brother? Oh my gosh. Why? Uh, was that just that, that? Was that Nozomi or was that just the hospital being like, this is going to help you? Like how they used to freaking lobotomize people because they thought they were mentally insane or do shock therapy and all that bullcrap? Ah, oh, frick. Gosh dang it. This must be why she's slightly tweaked. <laughs> Returning to her senses, she breathed erratically as she tightly gripped the sheets lining the bed. Her body trembled as those dark memories of hers resurfaced in her mind. The nurse that had been in the room just a moment ago was already gone. Dinner time had just arrived at the hospital, and the clamorous sounds that came from it resounded from down the hall. Ayase tried to recall the words the nurse had spoken to her right before leaving. Was her headache really just a side effect of the drugs she was on? Or had it been caused by her hitting her head, perhaps? Or perhaps it was just a hallucination brought forth by her past memories? She was unable to come to a decisive conclusion. <laughs> Wiping away the sweat that ran down her forehead, Ayase called forth a smile laced with self-loathing. It matters not. It is in the past. For I endured and survived my divine punishment. I will not let it control me anymore. Murmuring in perhaps delirium, Ayase soon became aware of a sound reverberating throughout the hall. The comforting sound of shoes stepping on the linoleum floor. It was certainly not being made by a nurse, and the sound of footsteps was heading right for the room she was in. Bro, is it gonna be freaking? Uh, there's no way it's Sua, right? Someone knocked on her door, and she sealed her lips tight. Excuse me. I freaking knew it, dude. I'm so, gosh dang it. I called, I can call these things, man. I just knew it. I knew he would freaking be there. He keeps trying to figure out these patients and stuff. I bet he's going to be like, you know, you were running away with uh, Takami, right? I need to know more about him and all that, right? Gosh dang it. I knew it. Oh, man, Sue was getting too deep, man. They're going to end up killing him. That someone was but a single man. He had come bringing gifts. Namely, a large basket filled with all manner of fruit. <laughs> she could recognize the man, which was far from a good sign. Thus, she stared at him with a dubious glare. Hi there. Oh, uh, no need to be on edge, you know. I'm... I know who you are. The man was a detective at the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department. He had once shadowed Ayase, as she was originally a suspect for the new gen case. Oh, okay. The detective, relieved by her response, scratched his head. His demeanor was unendingly casual. Oh, wow, that's an ego boost. I'm so glad that such a pretty lady like you remembers little old me. You have a real good memory, huh? I'm impressed. <laughs> the detective moved closer to her bed. Ayase briefly glanced at her desword leaning against the window. 
It lay just outside her reach. <laughs> I just dropped by to check up on you. I do not believe you. What is your objective? Y yikes. <laughs> Talk about straight to the point. The detective flinched very overtly, his reaction perhaps bordering on theatrical. Well, <laughs> uh, I just had a little something to ask you, Iyase-chan. Uh, right. <laughs> I brought this. If you're up to it, you should really eat. The detective smiled innocently, presented the basket he had brought with him, then placed it at Ayase's feet without waiting for approval. They're super tasty. And expensive, too. <laughs> Boo-hoo-hoo. <laughs> I do not want it. <laughs> Get him, girl. <laughs> oh, come on. Let a guy show you some hospitality. I bought them just for you, you know. Well, I don't mind if you leave them for when your mom visits. She can cut up a few slices for you then. <laughs> oh, sh shoot. It's been years since you last saw your parents. Hasn't it, Ayase-chan? Despite the detective's insensitive remark, Ayase felt nothing in response to it. Her ties to her parents had been cut from a very young age. Her parents had a reputation to uphold, so a child that often caused problems like Ayase had been inconvenient to them, to say the least. Oh, that's freaking sad, man. Really? Man. Gosh, dang it. Okay. Her only remaining contact with them was the wire transfer she received for her living expenses each month. Though it could hardly be called that. So she's kind of like Takami, except Takami's parents seem to actually care about him. Interesting. I'm really sorry. The detective apologized, bowing down hastily. Ayase had only just gotten over the shock caused by her flashback so she was in no mood to speak with him. Nonetheless, she urged herself to talk all the same. What is it you wanted to ask? Do you wish for an alibi? Not at all! We've already talked enough about that. No, I'm happy to announce that you're no longer considered a suspect, Ayase-chan. You're totally in the clear, I promise. Have you learned of their motive? The culprits? Sorry, but I can't tell you that. It's a confidential part of the investigation. Is it Takumi? Can't confirm nor deny. The detective smirked. He was attempting to laugh the question away. <laughs> and yet... Something unrefined could be seen through the cracks of that smile. That said, Nishijo-kun sure is a weird kid, isn't he? You wouldn't really suspect him of being a killer based on how he looks. If he really is the culprit, then he's way too good at hiding his true nature. The guy would have to be a demon to be that good. Is he still a suspect? Nah, not really. The detective casually denied it with a smile, putting Ayase's persistent questions to rest. Oh, you didn't hear that from me, though. <laughs> he slipped up. <laughs> My supervisors will get real mad if they find out that I leaked any info. Not that I would blame them. I bet he's trying to play her. <laughs> Besides, I only just got off the hot seat with my superior. I think you met him once before. You remember him, Ayase-chan? Bansan? The detective with the scruffy black hair and the stubble? Ayase did remember him. When she had been questioned, 
That older detective had been even more talkative than the younger one she was conversing with now. His way of speaking had been a lot more assertive as well. He's always pretty quick to yell at me. <laughs> I swear, I can't go one shift without him calling me a schmuck. <laughs> Though, I don't know why I'm the schmuck when he's the one going off on these wild goose chases instead of investigating what we were assigned to do. And as the sweet cherry on top, he's been forcing me to go along with him for all of it. Feels like I'm going to lose my mind if this keeps up. Well, I'm sure he's a good guy at heart. And his intuition is razor sharp. From what I heard, he's had to lead some pretty difficult cases in the past. So that's probably why he's turned so hard-boiled. So this is what you wished to talk about? Why you came here? Ayase interrupted the man, and his smile quickly soured. Oh, uh, <laughs> sorry. I got a little sidetracked. Please keep everything I just told you a secret. Do this, and I, Suamamaru, will be indebted to you for the rest of my life. So? Um... For starters, why'd you do it? Oh boy. Despite his ambiguous phrasing, Ayase could tell that he was referring to her diving off the school rooftop. I already explained why several times to the other detective. To avert the resurrection of the wicked-hearted king, Gladiol, right? Gladiol? Okay. Yeah, that sounds like some chinibio crap. Okay. I did not do it with the intention to die. I did it merely to ascend my spirit to a higher stage. You said something similar about your songs too, yeah? The ones that are pretty popular with kids your age. And that was the second question he had for her. Ayase let out a faint sigh. <sighs> Those lyrics were not about New Gen in the slightest. I merely wrote them based on the Gladial Book of Psalms and Revelation, chapter 3, verse 102. Wait, the Gladial Book of Psalms and Revelation? What the frick? Does that have to do with the actual Bible? Uh, okay, wait a minute, let me think. So, oh, wait, okay, hold on. Let me look this up real quick. Let's just look at Psalms. Let's see, because that would be, wait, verse, oh, verse 102. There is no verse 102 in chapter three of either of those books, I don't believe. So I'll check real quick, just in case. I mean, it is the Gladio book. It's not the Bible, but I figured I should check just in case. Hold on. So yeah, not in Revelation. Let's see Psalms real quick. Uh, Psalm 3. Yeah, no, Psalm 3 is really short, so... Okay, so this is different. Interesting. Interesting, though. Okay, what are you talking about? The arrival of the wicked-hearted King Gladiol is nigh. This world shall soon know his presence. Only with seven stakes forged in blackened blood shed by Gladiol himself... May his resurrection be averted. The stakes shall be reforged into swords, and the swords shall be bestowed upon the seven black knights who withstood divine punishment itself. Wait a minute. Reforged into swords, that's gotta be D swords, right? And the seven, the seven black knights. Let's count everybody that we have so far. We have Takumi, we have Ayase, we have Sena, we have Orihara, we have Dimi, we have Yua. Who's the seventh? I don't think I'm missing. Oh, oh, Nanami. Nanami, that's seven. That's all of them, dude. That's the Black Knights, baby. Oh, frick me. Oh, no. Yeah, okay. So there's some sort of a prophecy going on here. And again, I still think Miss Mikun is not a part of it. I think he's just part of the delusion that, that Dimi's a part of, whatever that is, so... 
Frick, man. Okay. An eye for an eye. A tooth for a tooth. For only mortals, burdened with wicked hearts, may overthrow the wicked-hearted king. W wow! <laughs> that sounds like something straight out of a movie. I love me a crazy epic storyline like that. Ayase glared at the detective in response to his comment. <laughs> it is not some sort of storyline. It is reality. I mean, okay, sure. In a game where everything is about delusions, it's like, sure, yeah, fine, it's reality, whatever. <laughs> well then, I've got one more question for you. The detective casually brushed away Ayase's objection, though she was all too used to this form of dismissal by now. Not a single person she had told this story to thus far had believed it. You know, we've investigated a lot of other students at Suimei other than you and Nishijo-kun, and... well... Hmm... The detective mumbled to himself as he folded his arms. This was very obviously another act of theatrics, and Ayase had no intention of commenting on it. What is it? Well... <laughs> this is gonna sound a little crazy. And it's not something a detective should be asking, really. <laughs> and it's kinda childish, if I'm being honest. I see. If you do not intend to ask me something, then take your leave. Dang. My head... hurts. Oh, uh... Okay, wait. Um, what I was trying to say is... Bonsan said something really weird once. That you guys... Must be wizards or something. Oh, right, he said that uh, last episode, didn't he? Upon hearing that the subject of that remark was plural, Ayase raised her eyebrows in suspicion. That's obviously not true, right? <laughs> we are. Oh. As she replied, Ayase's line of sight was directed not toward the man, but toward her hand that lay atop her bedsheets. <laughs> You're a very interesting gal, Ayase-chan. But... New Chen is wholly unrelated to the Knights of Gladiol. Hmm. Gotcha. Well... Not that it really matters either way. The detective, completely disinterested in what Ayase had just said, brushed off her words once again, and began to stretch. The moment he did so, a digital sound suddenly cut through the silence of the room. The detective, surprised by this interruption, reached into the pocket of his suit and took out his cell phone. Oh, jeez. <laughs> cell phones aren't allowed in here, huh? Shoot, uh, I must have forgot to power it off. Oh man, and it looks like a certain girl's calling me. <laughs> it's my lovely girlfriend. We've been together for four years now, can you believe it? Oh, he's got a girlfriend? Okay, either that or he's lying. He turned his phone off with a grin, forcing the caller to hang up. He then turned to Ayase once more. You a movie buff, Ayase-chan? Actually, I think he did mention that he had a girlfriend at one point, didn't he? Pretty sure he did. Ever heard of Spark Wars? <laughs> My ringtone's the Count Darth Spider theme from the movie. A.K.A. the thing you just heard. Oh, that's why it kind of sounded like... Okay, yeah, it sounded like the Imperial March or whatever it's called. <laughs> Ayase had no interest in movies nor anything of the sort. Having long since decided that she had no obligation to further entertain the detective's questioning, 
she returned to gazing silently outside the window. To be honest, I'm kind of a Spark Wars superfan. Oh, but judging from, uh, that, you're probably not interested. <laughs> Sorry. Well, guess I'll get out of your hair now. See ya. Interesting. With that, the detective concluded the conversation with which he had no partner, and then left the hospital room. Ayase did not even turn around to watch him go. So, is he trying to do this behind Bond's back? Because he said that he wanted to do these things alone, so I wonder if he's trying to figure out something that he feels like Bond isn't telling him, because he just asked, he's like, are you guys wizards, right? And that one seemed pretty serious, that, that questioning, but, and they had already been to her before, so what is he after is what I want to know. I feel like he's trying, he probably feels like he's being played or something. Oh, I just, I have a feeling Sue is going to get bipped. Gosh, dang it. With the man gone, all that reflected in her eyes was the twilight sky slowly turning indigo. <laughs>